All right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Thank you for joining me for another blessed Shabbat today. Today we have a surprise. Okay. Um, this is the end of the Feast of Tabernacles lesson, part three. Okay. So without further ado, uh, let's do a quick recap and get into it. We understand we went over the initial Feast of Tabernacles and how it was established by the Most High with Moses, okay? But the second portion, in part two of this lesson, we went under the in gathering of Christ and that harvest that he refers to uh, so much in the book of Matthew, and then the Gospels, how it's important to this very feast day. Leading up into Zechariah and in Joel, okay? Let me see Zechariah here. This was the final say-so of the Feast of Tabernacles and how it pertains to now. Um, and when everything is said and done, we will be having Feast of Tabernacles and living in Tabernacles, really, um, uh, as we prepare and get closer to Zion and wait for the last judgment of this earth. All nations will come and serve um, who want to get into the kingdom of heaven, and who love the Most High righteously. Right? And now, what you've been waiting for, the final portion of the Feast of Tabernacles. Part three is on the Holy Spirit, okay? And I'm really excited to share this with them, really excited, All right? So this one is the in-gathering, or you can say the Feast of Tabernacles under the Holy Spirit, but I would really say the ingathering of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see just why I say it, right? So if we understand the Feast of Tabernacles was gathering up the fruits during the time, okay, and and and, and preservation for the winter and the tough months ahead, we understood that Christ was referring to the harvest as the end of the world, okay? And so, if he's gathering and he's using the harvest as, as an analogy or a parable to the end of the world, what comes out of the harvest? We understand fruits where to come out of the harvest. So, without further ado, Let's get into the ingathering of the Holy Spirit and see how this pertains to just about the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, first John. I go to first John, or excuse me, John chapter five, John chapter 15. I apologize. John chapter 15, verse one through eight. And it reads, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, 
except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein my Father is glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Now, for your understanding, Christ is the vine. The gardener, a husbandman, is a gardener. Okay, let's, let's pay close attention to this one really quick. I'm gonna break this all down for you. A husbandman is like a gardener, right? So it's the most high who has the oversight where he wants to plant, okay? But he's planted one vine. That's his son, our savior, Christ, okay? And that vine is supposed to grow. All right. And what is grown from that vine? I'm going to jump around really quickly. Five, verse five. What is grown from that vine? Us. Because Christ said, ye are the branches. So we are supposed to be growing from Christ, all right? Now, an indication to understand how we are growing from Christ is verse two. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Who is he? That's the most high. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And who is he? The Most High. So here, there's a distinction between two types of people. I always tell people this, and they look at me like I've lost my mind. There's two types of people in the truth. There are those who bear fruit, and there, there are those who bear no fruit, okay? Simple classification, those who bear fruit are wheat. Those who bear no fruit are tares. Those who bear fruit are doers and wise listeners. Those who bear no fruit are just listeners. That's going all the way into James, okay? So there's a correlation. The whole Bible, from the beginning of the gospel all the way into the end, it gives us an understanding that there are two types of believers. It don't matter what denomination you are. You either are on one side or the other. You are a doer of the Most High or you're not. Because one, there's no denomination in the Bible. There's the most high, right? There's the most high. Okay. And, and and I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I'm saying. That doesn't mean you can be a Catholic or, or a Muslim and, and get to the kingdom. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. You have to follow Christ. Everything starts with Christ. Everything ends with Christ. Okay. Now. 
really quickly, verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Why did Christ say we are clean? Because the word sanctifies us. Okay. The word cleanses us. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That word is all the ways that Christ has taught us. How do we know this? Verse 4, he goes on to say, abide in me. Okay. He says, abide in me. Look what it means to stay. Okay. Abide means continue. Dwell, endure, remain, stand. Okay, so Christ is saying, continue my works. Stand in my works. Endure with my works. Don't endure this world on your own. Endure through my ways. Because at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, there are two paths. And you're going to hit one of the end of those roads. Why not hit the end of the road with me? Right? Why not come to the end of the road in Christ? You're guaranteed food, shelter, clothing. And at the end of that road, you're guaranteed an eternal sense of peace, right? So Christ is saying, abide in me and I in you. The only way that he can abide in us is if we were what? Made clean through him. And he is the word made flesh, right? So, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken. If he is the word made flesh, then what does he mean when he says, which I have spoken unto you? Christ is clearly giving us an indication of accepting him. And if we accept him, we are cleansed. Okay. And when I say cleanse, that comes with the process. Right? The remission of sins, following his ways, preaching what? Preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay? So verse 4, Christ says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except ye abide in the vine, no more can ye accept, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And this scripture is so important to the world, even people who don't even believe in the Bible. I want to show you how. Christ says in the second sentence, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. That means, do you know how many people are just living to live? Do you know how many ideas and inspirations have died in people's hearts and minds? because they couldn't carry anything out? Do you understand that you cannot bear good fruits of what? Of itself. The branch, which is us, as humans, we cannot bear fruit alone, which means if you are not in Christ, you will never bring good fruits. That also shuts down what? Not only does it shut down why people have so many good ideas, but they always 
hit the pavement and, and they hit the they hit a brick road and it never gets done. But it also teaches us what? There's no such thing as good people unless they reside in Christ. Isn't that what the world says? Oh, well, I'm just trying to be a good person. Christ didn't even call himself good, but he said what? You cannot be useful if you cannot bring forth fruit, right? I'm going to continue this same sentence. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. And this is Christ saying, now he's getting on a simpler level and saying, this goes for every individual. So if you want to do something and Christ is not in the, the foundation of that action, it's going to hit a brick road. This is what we talked about before, the foundation of Christ, right? If it's not built on the foundation of Christ, you are going to have a world of struggle to get that one thing done. That goes to bring me back to verse two, because if you have a world of struggle to get one thing done, you know Christ isn't in. But watch this second portion. In every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth that it may bring forth more fruit. So you're meaning to tell me that the most high is going to purge you. Everyone knows <laughs> purge means what? It's a cleansing, right? So how do you get purged? You get purged by the fire, right? I was, I could not express enough. If you have not watched my lesson on, <laughs> on the Day of Atonement, part five, you gonna wanna Listen to that very closely because I revealed that in the Bible, it tells us the ministry of Christ is based on one thing, reconciliation. Even Paul says it, the ministry of reconciliation. So you mean to tell me every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it means he puts it in the fire so that you bring forth more. That means every good fruit knocks off a negative thing that you may have done in the past. <laughs> That's what it says, he beareth fruit, he purges it. He purges it. It makes expiation, it cleanses from sin. Get this word for y'all. Look what it says. Expiation, a religious act by which satisfaction or atonement is made for the commission of some crime, the guilt done away, and the obligation to punishment canceled. So every time you bring forth fruits of Christ, you are canceling a judgment that you should have gotten. Well, isn't that mercy? Isn't that mercy? And so he's going to what? He's going to purge the fruit He's going to put the trials, he's going to put the branches in a trial so that they can continue what? Producing 
fruits to cancel away their judgment. That is the reason you are tried in the furnace. That is a reason, there's a reason why it says, count it all joy when you go into diverse temptations, which is trials, because you, the individual, is being given an opportunity to produce fruits that will cancel away your sins and your judgment. Shouldn't everyone know this? I, I think that's pretty important. Moving forward. Verse five. Christ says, I am the vine, ye are the branches, which is us. He that abide in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So, uh, uh, I want to see this word, right? Without me, <laughs> okay? Without, separately or apart, okay? So, that means what? The opposite. If you're not with Christ, you're against him. If you're not dealing with Christ in the ways of Christ, you are never going to bring forth fruit. So this was a covenant, as I mentioned before. And <laughs> y'all really go, if you haven't watched it, praise the most high if you have uh, part five, but if you haven't watched it, go ahead and watch it. The, this is the New Testament right here. I don't know if anyone knows that testament means covenant. Does anyone know that? So the Old Testament means old covenant. The New Testament means the new covenant. Okay, I showed that in the last part of the Day of Atonement. So this Christ, is the new covenant, which means we are to bear and bring forth fruit. That is the new covenant. Okay. So it makes everyone partakers of righteousness, not just the Levites back then, right? And those who were tasked of it. But he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. That means it don't matter if you a servant, a janitor, a teacher, a counselor, a, a, a social worker, uh, if you flip burgers, you are gonna be able to bring forth much fruit if you are in Christ. I don't care where you are, <laughs> okay? It doesn't matter where you are. You will bring forth tons of fruit. Now, I want you to also recognize this vine can only be grown on what? Good ground. Can it be grown on stony ground? Can it be grown on thorns? No. Vines that are fruitful grow on good ground. So now we're seeing all the parables come together, aren't we? Wow. So if you are a seed, and your foundation is good ground, you are in Christ, and you are always going to bring good fruit. Okay. <laughs> moving forward, and moving forward. So you see, also, for without me, you can do nothing. That's why those who were what? On the journey, but Satan came and took it away. Well, hey, that, that, that when Satan, and, and you see, <laughs> I want you to understand Mark 4, right? When Satan came, 
didn't Christ, wasn't Christ attacked in Matthew chapter 4? He was attacked. Satan came to Christ and he tried to take the word of the Most High and twist it. So Mark 4 is a direct correlation to the temptations of Christ from Satan. This is a direct correlation. The thorns, Satan said, I'll give you this kingdom. All you got to do is bow to me. So now Satan was coming with the same tricks, but just a little less, little less requirement and fine print because Christ wasn't going to care about this world when he what? He already had the one to come. Christ wasn't going to care about this world because it was already prophesied and already commanded by the great I am that it was going to be destroyed and that he should be looking for the next kingdom. That's why he preached to people, in my father's house, there are many mansions. So he wasn't teaching people to be settled on earth. He was teaching people to be ready for him. You see that? Okay. So understand, th this is direct correlation to the sower seed. Okay. Verse six. But man abide not in me. He casteth forth. He is cast forth as a branch and wither, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, this withered is really important. Unfortunately, I believe they've taken some things out of the Bible. We know this is true. Um, we understand that the Most High did this on purpose because he wants diligent searchers, but there's a breakdown of this withered branches in the shepherd of Hermes. And boy, is it scary because it's it goes so in depth. Because a lot of people actually, believe it or not, a lot of people believe in the vine, but a lot of people are withered as well. And it gives classification to your sins and your repentance, how good your repentance is, how sincere it is, and all that determines whether a person is withered. If your repentance is just like, eh, most high, I'm sorry, you know, whatever. I won't do it again. That, that's not going to cut it for the most high. Okay. I'm going to show you exactly why that's not going to cut it. Verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. How come, right? Whenever someone is talking about prayer, they always use the one opposite to this one, okay? Ask and it shall be given to you. Ask in my name, right? Isn't that the always the scripture that Christians and believers give? but they never use this one, do they? If ye abide in me, notice how Christ is saying, if. <laughs> he didn't say, ask and it shall be given unto you because this scripture goes with the other one when it says ask and it shall be given to you, right? It's a correlation, It's a it, everything goes together. If ye abide in me and my words, <laughs> right? And my words, look at this, right? And my words, topic, a matter or topic, command, okay? So if Christ commands in his 
matters and topics in which he gave us in the gospels abide in you if his sayings abide in you you shall ask whatever it is you want and it shall be done unto you now i can, I, I want to bring this out and unto you okay and when it says it shall be done cause to be to become or come into being okay look happen grow now i mentioned this also in the day of atonement lesson when something grows you need what patience so he was clearly saying when it says it shall be done unto you you would need patience to watch it grow and manifest in your life you wouldn't just get it when you want it as we can see it also states of miracles to be performed <laughs> okay so you wasn't going to get what you want immediately he was going to make sure you what he was going to make sure that you bring forth much fruit Okay, moving forward, verse eight, herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Okay, a learner, a pupil, and I, and, and I know that, you know, Many people may say, oh, a disciple just means a follower. I want you to understand this, right? When the, when the word disciple, and this is why we have to really go and look, right, into the scripture, okay? And you have to really study to show thyself approved. It means to learn. So when Christ is saying, ye shall be my disciples, it means ye shall learn of me, of Christ. Did it say learn of Moses? Did it say learn of, of everything else? Did it say learn of the different religions? It said learn of Christ. So a disciple means someone who is consistently learning about Christ. Now we can see, watch this. How many people in the world are disciples of Christ? Very few. How many times people wanna just learn about Paul, <laughs> right? Talk them to Christ. You bring them to Christ and they talk about Paul. You bring them to Christ and they talk about Moses. Well, the last time, I thought Moses was working for the Most High. And the last time I thought, Paul became an apostle from Christ. <laughs> Which means Christ was the answer from the very beginning. But you see, scribes and Pharisees hate Christ. And you know, that that very spirit of scribes and Pharisees, that's why Christ said, take heed that no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name. Because the spirit of scribes and Pharisees is over a good portion of the world. How many people are learners of disciple uh, of learners or disciples of Christ? How many people are learning Christ? 
order? How many people are learning Christ, um, Christ's ways? Let me bring this out real quick for y'all. Okay. Because I, I, I want to share this with y'all. If anyone missed it, if anyone missed it, okay. So Hebrews 12, just, just a, just a, just a, because this is all relevant, brothers and sisters. Hebrews 12 and 24, and to Yesha, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now, watch me here. So that was Hebrews 12 and 24. Hebrews 8 and 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish. Right? Follow me. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily, the first covenant also had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay. So as we understand, this was this chapter is really talking about what? <laughs> it, it is really talking about the, the the differences between the order of Moses and the order of Christ. Verse 9, or verse 11 in Hebrews 9, it says, But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Okay. Hint, hint. Chapter. 10, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds will I write them and their iniquities, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now you may be saying, why am I bringing this up? Hebrews 13 and 20. Now. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Yeshua, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of an everlasting covenant. Okay, now let's go back to Hebrews 8 and 13. One last one. Now repeat it. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Okay, and now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Let me show it to y'all. As you can see in the Greek corresponding New Testament, in Greek is dathiki, which is rendered testament. Okay. Testament means covenant. <laughs> okay. Testament means covenant. All right. Testament means covenant. I'm going to Okay. I want to share that with everyone because you have to understand 
even so even now when the scripture talks about what when the scripture talks about that you know when when people are in the vine are in christ that means you are in his new covenant you are following what he says the old testament is the old covenant the new testament is the new covenant now, shouldn't people understand that? It's very important. So now we understand those who are stuck in the Old Testament, why they're not going to make it. Because what? The new covenant is everlasting. Okay. That vine is everlasting. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Matthew 7 and 15 through 20 reads, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits shall ye know them. Okay. So clearly, <laughs> I want people to understand that verse 15, Christ says, beware of prophets. So whether you believe, right? Whether you believe that people today are prophets, Christ said they are. I want you to understand that, <laughs> okay? Next, you have to understand what a prophet is, okay? A spurious prophet that is pretended foreteller or religious imposter, okay? This is a false prophet. A spurious prophet that is pretended foreteller or religious imposter. Okay. You may be wondering, what is spurious? It means someone who is not genuine. I can't emphasize this enough. <laughs> Lack of enthusiasm, no genuine behavior. It says that Christ calls these individuals false prophets, imposters. These are what? Tears. Okay. These are tears okay i got one last time as you can see here it says one also who falsely claims to speak by divine inter by divine inspiration also other as a pillar of future events or as a teacher of doctrine trends so a false prophet it would can still be a what a pastor an elder a bishop a deacon okay it's a religious imposter okay so christ said beware of these false prophets which come to you and sheep's clothing now look 
what Christ the definition is. Something that walks forward, okay? Now, and then clothing, of course, is the garment, the outer appearance. So you would say something that looks to have done right on the outside. But deep down inside, oh yeah, they hurt. They hurt. But it says what? Inwardly, they are ravening wolves. What does ravening mean? Extortion, rapacious. Okay, it says they are given to plunder, accustomed to seize by violence. Look, accustomed to seize for food, subsisting on prey or animals seized by violence. And I'm gonna get this also in our main dictionary. So you get two different. Look, rapacious means aggressively greedy and grasping. Root word raps or rapier means to snatch. Okay. So aggressively greedy and grasping. Inwardly, they are aggressively greedy. All right. And look what look what look what all these words mean. These false prophets. So Christ was telling you inwardly they have or show extreme greed for wealth and material gain. Oh, so they want to what? Coheres the people, right? They want to, you know, gain money from people, their followers. This, and this may be some people, you know, Lord Most High. I'm going to tell you this. I am a true believer that you can spot a false prophet by the followers they have. I'm a true believer. Because if Christ was on correction, and people would go to Christ and people would go excited and then they would leave away disappointed. Well, I believe that people who follow Christ have very few people with them. At least at this moment. Now we know the elect will have thousands and hundreds. Of, that's in a different light. But right now, I believe you can spot a wolf <laughs> in the sheep's clothing by the number of followers they have. Because they're going to be extremely greedy. So they're going to what? Tiptoe around offenses. One thing, and, and, and I want you to understand what I was just sharing. I was just sharing when the man came from Christ and said, Christ, I wanna follow you, I wanna follow you. And Christ said, do you keep the commandments? He said, yes, yes, I do all that. And then he said, give to the poor. And then he walked away sad, right? So a lot of people are not going to follow Christ. They're going to follow his words, but they're not going to follow his actions. And that's where we become hearers, right? We're going to become doers. That's when people become hearers. So what does this mean? As I said, you can spot a false prophet by the number of the followers they have, if our Lord and Savior didn't have thousands or millions of people, what makes you think someone on this earth who's following Christ would have hundreds of thousands of followers, right? If he said the servant is no greater than the master, wait a minute, <laughs> right? Wait a minute. If the servant is no greater than the master, and if you are in Christ and they shall treat you the same way as Christ, 
And we're no better than Christ, not even close. What makes you think you would get a lot of followers on this earth? Unless you had a what? Motive. <laughs> well, you see, they're not going to break this down properly for those who have motive. They're going to easily bypass the sheep and wolf's folk. And yeah, they're going to give a basic. And you notice how when I teach you guys, I bring out all the definitions. I bring out all the words because one, I have no motive to deceive anyone. I have my intention. My motive is to get you to the kingdom. That's my motive. My motive is so that you can arm yourself spiritually to understand what the gospel is saying. Because the most high has given me this blessing to understand, now it's my job to return it so that others can understand, okay? Verse 16 reads, "'Ye shall know them by their fruits. "'Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles?' Okay, now this scripture is usually very, very, <laughs> it's a scripture that's usually, you know, passed by often. Why do I say that? Because it's talking about gathering grapes of thorns or figs of thistles, right? But just as I say to you all, brothers and sisters, every single time we serve a father who what? Wants quality not quantity. So are you gonna gather grapes with thorns? Are you gonna, you're gonna what? You're gonna pick off those thorns before you bring them home, right? Clean up your grapes, wash them, right? Or are you gonna have figs with thistles? You want, you want, you want the, the branches and, and all the stuff still in there? You're gonna clean it out to know them by their fruits. Are they detailed? Because really, that's what it means, right? Let's look at this word, thistle. It's a thorn, right? It's a briar, Oof. right? So really, you shall know them by their fruits, right? Verse 20, wherefore you shall know them by their fruits, their actions. But Let's break it down a little further. With action, behind every action comes a character. All right, whoa, right? Behind every action, you can see a person's character. And behind that character lies their motive. Ooh. right? So guys are saying, the sheeps and wolf clothing, they gonna gather grapes with thorns. They gonna just get anybody and keep it. They don't care about quality for the most high. They care about quantity. They, I'm gonna say it again, they do not care about quality. They care about quantity. That's why you, have you ever noticed that you hear every pastor, T.D. Jakes, Joe Olsen, Joe Ma, Creflo, that all these people, all the, sh all the wolves in sheep clothing always have to make themselves feel better? to not be condemned by scripture by saying, I've helped thousands of people worldwide. Do you notice they all say the same thing? <laughs> Does anyone notice that? Did Christ ever do that? I, I wanna share something. <laughs> 
real quick and give you an example. Right? Let me see if I can. One moment. Matthew chapter four. I'm going to show show you something really cool here. Now, Christ is known for teaching in Jerusalem, yeah? He's known for teaching in Israel. Now, verse 23 reads, chapter 4, verse 3, And Yeshua went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease and among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. Wait, what? Syria? That's not Israel. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those who were possessed with devils, and those who were lunatic, and those that had the palsy and healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. So wh when did we ever hear Christ saying, well, do you know what I've done for these people in this part of the world? I've affected these people. In the did you ever hear Christ say that? But look what it says. His fame went all throughout without him even having to say a word. <laughs> Showing you what? Just because you have, you, 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 you don't need to publicize it. How many times did Christ say, don't tell them at this moment? Right? He was a very reserved individual because it was all about timing for the Most High. And it was all about bringing glory to the Most High. Right? Bringing us back to Matthew 7, verse 17. Every, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Let's look at this word good. Now you see this word good, good things, well, means benefit. Okay, and I'm going to go into another one. So good means valuable and virtuous for appearance and use. <laughs> okay. Good means valuable and virtuous for appearance and use. So every good tree bringeth forth good fruit means the actions that they do are valuable and useful for others. Right? And let's take it this way, right, brothers and sisters? If you are a farmer and you have an orchard, are you going to eat all those apples? You're going to want to what? Share them, right? So your fruits should be what? Shared with others. They should be useful and valuable for others. I'm talking too much, no sir. Also ties into our what? Talents, right? That they're useful and valuable for others. Now we understand why the saying is 
the next verse, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So that really means what? A good tree. The people aren't worried about themselves. They're worried about their works being useful for others. And this is why good trees cannot produce evil fruit. It goes upon selflessness. All right, verse seven, 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Let's, we'll go on that word, bringeth forth, just to show you. It says to make or do. It says to abide. And I'm not going to read all of them. Okay. To work. Okay. To perform, to provide. Okay. So in simpler terms, to make, to do, to prepare, to produce. Provide, okay. So bring forth me to to make. Just ask yourself a question. Simply, and this is not a question to to hurt anyone's feelings, but it's just a self evaluation, right? Because the scriptures tell us, examine that thy be in the faith, right? Are your fruits being used for gain? Or are you looking for the fruits to be useful to others? I can show you an example, right? So I make music for the most high. And, and I know a lot of people are not going to like what I have to say. They will say, well, you know, I want to use my, you know, uh, my, my talents to, to, to make some money for me and my family. You know. So if the music is not for gain, then it is a fruit that I'm going to continue producing because watch this, right? Let's say if I don't get listeners, let's say if I don't get followers, let's say if I don't even get money from it, are you still going to be producing that fruit? So for the people who say, oh, the most I gave me the gift and I'm going to use it, I'm going to sell it. You see, the gift now becomes what? It becomes profit. It doesn't become a fruit. It becomes profit. Because a fruit, if someone eats the fruit, do you get something from it? <laughs> do you get something from an eaten fruit already? No, it's already, it's already eaten, right? A fruit is for use. It's to fill the person inside and say, mm, you know what, this apple was good. Maybe I'll go back to that orchard. Maybe I'll go back to that. You know what? Imagine if I had five apples and I could make a whole uh, pie with the, their apples, right? So they'll come back naturally to the fruit. Evil has to get a profit for people to come back to the fruit. You see that? Think about it because they want money from it. Now they're selling their talents. Now they're selling what was meant to be good so they can receive gain. And we said what? Those wolves are those who want gain, right? They want something. There's nothing that can be done from the love of their heart. This is why I say a lot of people hate me when I say, oh, you know, uh, I make music, but I make it for free. It's all on YouTube. Why? Because it's not about money. It's about people hearing the gospel and the scriptures to hopefully motivate them. Maybe to carry on, push through, maybe open their eyes up to the things that's going on in the world. It's not so I can get money. <laughs> all right. Hope that makes sense. Anyway. All right, moving forward. 
but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And let's look up corrupt. Yep, it, it, it says it, and we were talking about this last time, right? Worthless. A corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A worthless tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Yeah. Now look now look at under what it says. Of poor quality. Didn't I tell you the most high is about what? Quality, not quantity. Quality. Talking about the kingdom of heaven shining bright, people getting robes of white, crowns of glory. Quality, right? He had Noah make a boat of quality wood, right? He had them make the ark of quality, right? All the, the, the priestly garments were of quality measure, right? We serve a father who's of quality. So it says the corrupt is rotten, that is worthless, okay? Now, look what it says. To petrify and I, I know i may be pronouncing that wrong but petrif okay and i want to bring this out cause to putrefy okay and I, this is a big word here and i want to bring this one out let me get my dictionary It says, to what? To decay or rot and produce a fetid smell, okay? To decay or rot and produce a fetid smell. And if you didn't know what fetid means, extremely unpleasant, stink. Okay. That's what it means. All right. So the corrupt tree, think about it, right? They do something and you're just looking at it like, what is this? You're like, what, what, can you imagine the most high looking at someone giving him something or giving people and the most high just saying, what, what, what is this? So I want you to understand this, right? The trees are people. Okay. Do you not recognize that the most high here is also not talking just about quality, but it's talking about representation, how you give your fruit. Either it's good or it's what? It's worthless, it's rotten. Hmm. Verse 18 says, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth, forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits shall ye know them. This is how you know people. So think about it, right? Are they producing good fruits? Are they consistent? Is it for money? Are they doing it for the love of their hearts? Very important to know. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 to 33 to 35. And I read, 
either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And why did I share this? I mean, this is really big. To me, this is really big, right? Christ was saying, all right, make a choice. Either be one or the other. But you're going to be known by your fruits. All right? He's saying generation of vipers. Let's understand. A viper, an adder, someone's just poisonous, cunning. Okay? So now we have referring to people as what? Wolves, as sheep's clothing. He's calling this a generation of vipers. Okay, he's calling them ravening wolves. Could it be that this is why Christ said, be wise as serpents because you are living in a generation of vipers? I think so. Verse 34, oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Let, woo, let, 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 let's, 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 let's bring this right here. Abundance. Let's see what abundance is. All right? A surplus or superabundance coming from the word of the heart. To be in excess, okay? The increase. One moment, please. All right. Moving forward. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So whatever is on in your heart, that is what your mouth will speak. I love what Christ is saying, right? Because he said, being evil, how can you being evil speak good things? So Christ is saying, whether you speak good, okay, whether you are a viper or a ravening wolf and you speak good, your tongue is always going to correlate back to what is truly in your heart. That's how people will catch you. You ever notice, like, for somehow, like, do you notice how every like, you know, TV pastor, right? Every time they finish preaching, they always have like a good 15 minutes of telling you why they sh you should be tithing, <laughs> right? At the end, well, you know, let me give you this scripture and that scripture, <laughs> right? So at the end of everything they said, now they want tons of money and nothing is wrong with tithing, but I, I'm a believer that tithing should be given out of the heart. You shouldn't have to ask for tithing. You, you and I all know very well the world we live in, okay? 
you know very well how hard it is for ministers and pastors who are not mega billionaires to live and those who are deeply in scripture so you should they shouldn't have to have ministers and all the people who do the good work of the most high they shouldn't even have to ask okay and that was even in scripture no one should have to ask for it all right verse 35 a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things now the key word here brothers and sisters is to look at this word treasure okay it says a deposit wealth okay Root word to place okay to place to settle also means purpose Okay, so now we see out of a good man, out of the good, what? Purpose of the heart bringeth forth good things. Treasure means purpose, right? What their, what their intentions are. Out of a good man, a good man, out of a good purpose, which is treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil purpose which is their treasure to do what they want to do, bringeth forth evil things, all right? But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Very important. Now, <laughs> I'm going to bring this out. Idle. Okay. Do understand. It's showing here. Idle means Argos. Okay. I'm going to break this up into different because idle means quite a few things right so notice idle means inactive unemployed lazy useless barren idle or slow but here we see in the the dictionary idle means useless thing ineffectual it means unfruitful okay it means trifling in vain of no importance idle reason idle arguments also means unprofitable not tending to edification haven't i been saying this brothers and sisters if someone talking to you and it ain't edifying shoe fly don't bother me because those words you will say and that those words that conversation you do engage in they will be judged and think about this right if your words are going to either justify you or condemn you that means Christ is going to say, well, I heard you talking to this woman over here. I heard you talking to this cousin or this friend or your coworker over here. Now, because you were blabbing about, you know, the talk show that you seen two weeks ago, why wasn't you talking about me? You know how easy it is to change a conversation, don't you? Oh, they was talking about, oh, did you see uh, this conversation? If it wasn't about the Bible, if it wasn't edification to show you something that's big coming from the Bible, 
why are you talking about? Because by our words, we are justified. And what does that mean? We are regarded as righteous and innocent, right there. Our words regard us as righteous or innocent. Hmm. Come on now. Or they are going to condemn us. And what does that say? Our words are going to pronounce us guilty. <laughs> so think about it, right? That's why I, 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 don't, I don't do entertaining people. I, I can't, I can't. I, I prefer to, to be like, you know, hey, if you're not talking to the Bible about the Bible, the Most High or Christ or the Holy Spirit, how to get into the kingdom, it should be something based on the Bible. And if it's not, I, I, I don't know why we're speaking. <laughs> As a minister, I'm going to sit there and say that, like, really, like, you know, and I strongly encourage people, you got to be that blunt, like, Okay, if someone's approaching me, I'm gonna hear them out because I am a minister and see, do you wanna to come to Christ? Do you wanna to get to the kingdom? Do you wanna serve the most high? If it's not about that, please leave me be. Leave me be. You, I encourage everyone to be like that because you say, you know, my judgment is heavily entwined with the words I speak. Think about that. Our judgment is heavily intertwined with the very words we speak. So think about it this way. And what's what's so beautiful, if you really think about this right, it says, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Two different things Christ was saying here, all right? Your fruits and your words that follow with it. Right? And they're both actions of the tree. So he said, but I say unto you that every idle word which men shall speak shall give account therefore on the day of judgment. Judgment is what? That day of accusation. Now, let's look at this really quick. So do I understand, and, and a lot of people may not really understand that this is a two-tier thing, right? Because Christ said, there'll be some that will not die, right? There'll be some, this is that time. Do understand day is figuratively a period, which means what? Years or a time. So it doesn't, that's, that's necessarily mean when you pass. The day of judgment is referring to the end of the world. That is now. How do you know this? Or by your you speak blessings, or by your words, you receive curses. Justified means blessings, condemned means curses, right? I'm talking too much, Most High. It's powerful stuff here. Okay. But instead, everyone's focus, right? So we see every good treasure comes from a good man that bring, and they will bring forth good fruit. Every evil man will have good or have evil treasures which result from evil things. They will be condemned for it, okay? Matthew chapter three, but it's 
verse 8. But instead of focusing on unrighteousness and knowing that you're going to be judged for the very things that you say in the life's time, meaning that you can go outside tomorrow and, and the things that you did today have a weight on how the most high carries your day for tomorrow. Because by your mouth, you shall be justified or condemned. Judgment is just as one thing. It says the day of judgment, which is a time. It could be your life. It could be a year. This is the time of recompense, is it not? Since COVID. All right. Matthew 3 and 8 says, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. And I just wanted to bring this scripture out because we're supposed to what? Provide. Remember I gave you that word, bring forth. It means to make, to do, to provide, right? Make, to do, provide, bring forth, okay? To work, to perform and provide. So to, we are, because the Most High gave us his son, our savior, we are to provide fruits that are what? Meat. Look, 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 look what it says. It says comparable. It says deserving and comparable. So meat means deserving for repentance. So bring forth, let's, let's, let's tie it all together, you guys. So we are to provide, therefore, fruits deserving for repentance. <laughs> right? That, that's hot stuff. That's amazing stuff. So, and the, and the, and the, you know, when I was in the army, I used to, you know, to hear sergeants say this all the time. And, higher ranking say, do what your pay grade can handle. So if you feel like making head coverings is, you know, worthy enough for the sins that you've done, hey, it's on you. If you feel that giving to the homeless once a year is good enough for your sins, hey, it's on you. But I know we all fall short of the glory, so I gotta figure out something. And I probably wanna figure out my talents that's actually going to help me produce more fruits. I'm just saying, because meat means what? It means for repentance. Luke 6, Luke chapter 6. Verse 43, Luke chapter 46, or excuse me, Luke chapter 6, verse 43 reads, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doeth a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns, Men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Now, of course, we already read this, so I just wanted to give a little more emphasis on it. Verse 44 says, for every tree is known by his own fruit. So do understand, do understand. And, and this is something that the tears don't understand. You cannot piggyback off of others. This is why what, if you follow my ministry, You've listened to me. If we have private lessons as well, you know, for those and in, 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 in who's where I'm at located, you understand 
even even on YouTube, because I try my best to give all the lessons that I do in person on YouTube, you understand that I was advocating for everyone to know their talent so you can become fruitful because you cannot piggyback off of another person. Everyone is special. Everyone has been planted a seed from Christ. Okay, so you must be able to know how to produce your own fruit and your talents is big on that. Okay, your talents will be heavily, uh, uh, you know, viewed on how you bring forth that fruit. If you're doing your talents, you know, like half crap, you know, guess what? It's a corrupt fruit because corrupt fruit it wasn't it wasn't you know it wasn't you know put on good ground it was put in thorns maybe it's damaged be presenting it not in the best way but but with good fruit it's on good ground okay one moment, please.
Sorry about that. Thank you for the the hold on the brief pause. All right. Moving forward from Luke chapter six, verse uh, 44, it's when we just left off of. So now we'll be going to Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter seven. Excuse me. A moment. I apologize. Added a scripture, so I'm going to take out Matthew 7. All right. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. And I read, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And so do understand, everyone, brothers and sisters, that these are the fruits that every tree is supposed to be producing. Okay? Remember, every vine is supposed to produce a fruit. Every tree is supposed to produce a fruit. Even, and, and this, brothers and sisters, makes the clear distinction of who is a good tree and who is a corrupt tree. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance okay and i'm going to break it down a little bit further more um in a little bit you'll understand but these are the pillars of what makes a good tree so just want you to think of what exactly makes a bad tree yes we know that they are the works of the flesh that is true, verse 18 to, or verse 19 to 21, but maybe you could understand it a little bit more in detail, and I'll give you that detail in just a moment, uh, not, not too far from now. James chapter 3, James chapter 3. Verse 9 through 12. And I read, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, 
and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Do with a fountain, send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And I had to include this one because I thought it was perfect, you guys. I thought it was perfect because Christ said, what? A good tree cannot produce corrupt fruit. And a corrupt and a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit, which means you, you had to have some some controlling of yourself and really examine. Now, this one is a really big thing for the Israelite community, even for Christians all over the world, because it seems to be that the mouth can just talk any kind of way and and still they praise the most high and still they want to thank people for Christ and for him dying for our sins yet blessings and cursings shouldn't come from the same place meaning they shouldn't come from that vessel they shouldn't come from that mouth okay so this also is an indication of how you can understand the fruit and how it and what type of tree you're dealing with and what type of fruit that tree is producing. Are they producing blessings or are they producing cursings? Right? And Luke chapter three. Luke chapter three, verse nine. And I read. And now also is, now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth forth not, excuse me, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. And I wanted to explain, a lot of people may not understand this. When, when this was said, even Christ mentioned this. When this was said, understand who is the vine. Christ is the vine. So the husband and the farmer is the most high. So who was holding the ax? The most high. So if the most high is using the ax to the root of the trees, that means judgment is here. That means you got to be careful before the Most High decides to just cut you off. Okay? Because his patience is only going to run so much for this world to continue. And if you're not where he wants you to be, if you're not producing fruits at the time he wants you to be producing fruits, according and especially according to prophecy, they're going to lay the ax to the root of the tree. They're going to dig it up. That's what this means. Now, also, the ax is laid into the root of the tree. So he's going to start chopping because he is not satisfied. Notice he chops what? He chops to every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit. Okay, so this is judgment. All right. Now, I know really quickly, I know everyone sees that there's scriptures under here. And this one was really special to me, uh, these three, because um, I just felt like it was like, wow. And usually most people don't talk about these three scriptures, but I want to bring them out and I want to, to share with you what I found. Okay. So 
So Luke chapter 9, verse 28. And I read, and it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings, and he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white And glisten. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Yeshua, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Yeshua was found alone, and they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. So yes, in verse 33, Peter and the disciples were saying, let us make three tabernacles, one for Christ, one for Moses, and one for Elias, okay? I know there's a lot of speculation as who might be Elias. I'm going to bring that out as well. Mark chapter 9. I'm going to start from verse 2. And it reads, and after six days, Yeshua. And after six days, Yeshua taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Now you may be wondering what this transfigured is. This is the changing of that continence of Christ. Okay, it's a change. Okay, it's a transformation. Okay. What transformation? Verse 3. And his raiment became shining and exceed, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth in white. Also, this is a direct correlation to those robes that will be given to the elect and all those that survive in Revelations. Moving forward, verse 4. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses. And they were talking with Yeshua. And Peter answered and said to Yeshua, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save, which means except, Yesha only with themselves. And as they came down 
from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? And I'll read this form, this part as well. And he said, excuse me, he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must su suffer many things and be sought at naught and be set at naught. And if you didn't know, set at naught means to be nothing, okay, treated treacherously or be considered a but I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. So you'll be wondering. A lot of people are wondering, who is Elias? Christ said Elias had already come. Okay. Matthew 17. Verse 1 through 3. And I read. And after six days, Yeshua taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Yeshua, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While yet, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Yeshua came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save except Yeshua only. And as they came down from the mountain, Yeshua charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? So do understand that the disciples were saying that the scribe said Elias must come first before their savior. That's it. And said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. Is all is but I say unto you that Elias already has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Okay, now, one, you need to understand, yes, in the very beginning, in verse 4, Peter said, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Okay. You need to know that Elias is Elijah. Okay. From the Old Testament. All right. 
Moses is Moses. Okay. And Christ is Christ. So they were making what? Three tabernacles. Okay. Tabernacle is a habitation. It's a place to dwell. Yes, we're in the Feast of Tabernacles. So you're understanding that they were wanting to make tabernacles for the three. And so what this means is they were wanting to make an observation for the three, Christ, Moses, and Elijah. What people don't understand, and know there's no reincarnation, <laughs> or a lot of people get that correct, incorrect, but when how we know that John is the Baptist, John the Baptist is coming in the form of Elias, it's referring to, in the Old Testament, there were two great men, Moses and Elijah. Elijah rained down fire, okay? Moses was the covenant set upon, all right? The old covenant. Who was the new covenant built upon? Christ, okay? So old covenant, Moses, new covenant, Christ. Old covenant, Elijah, new covenant, John. And so when Christ said, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things, he was referring to John because John was laying the path for people to understand that Christ is coming because what? He said, come and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And so we understand that they did treat John the Baptist all kinds of ways they, they beat on him, they put him in prison, they falsely accused him, they hated that John was bringing about baptism and they hated that John was preaching about Christ. Okay, so this is this was a correlation understanding that the, the, the three tabernacles, Christ, Moses, and Elijah also included John as well. So Christ's tabernacle was based on those three, Moses, Elijah, and then John the Baptist, all right? So I hope that, you know, and we can really, this is really a big, big uh, subject and we can go into more, but for the sake of, uh, you know, just sticking into this lesson, um, I hope that you understood that the tabernacles, it, it has it has a lot of correlation to do with the rulings of, you know, uh, Moses and Elijah. And think about it, the fire rained down also from the Passover as well, coming out of Egypt, all right? So you have to understand that same thing happened with Eli Elijah, okay? As far as the New Testament, once again, they're considering John the Baptist as Elias or as Elijah, just making the correlation that he was the other great man in the new covenant, which was under Christ, who laid the way for Christ to baptize people with the Holy Ghost and with fire, right? All right, moving forward. So I wanted to give, you know, a, a quick understanding of, you know, uh, the spiritual gifts based off of Galatians. So we have on the left in the yellow, it says fruit. And going down on the left column is the fruits. You broke them up in two pages. You have the second, uh, second column is definitions. Third is description, and um, the fourth uh, scripture. I won't I won't read the scriptures right now, 
um, but I'm giving them so that you guys understand just a little something where you can see love and joy and peace and the fruits of the spirit within the scriptures. I strongly advise everyone to really dive into those, okay? Um, because this is a really good ch chart that the Holy Spirit had me bring out and I thought it was awesome. So uh, I'm just gonna read the definition, the fruit, the definition and the description. All right, so it says love, the definition truly means, you know, like, and this is, you know, paraphrasing of myself, I'm not giving the exact um, definitions of the dictionary, but love is what seeks the highest good of others. The description uh, is more so love is not based on emotion or feelings, but rather it is a decision to be committed to the well-being of others without any conditions or circumstance. Uh, and, and you see, really, you know, when people have love within themselves and they, and they love the Most High and Christ and the Holy Spirit, even love in their personal relationships will work as well. But you have to understand, love is not loving someone with conditions or circumstances. Love has nothing to do with emotions or feelings. Love is because you want to be committed to the well-being of others, all right? The next fruit is joy. And joy is a gladness that's not based on circumstances. Joy is more than happiness. It is merely not based on financial success, good health, or popularity. But by believing in the Most High, obeying his will, receiving his forgiveness, committing good works with other believers, ministering to others, and sharing the gospel. This is how believers will experience joy. You know, this world has become so infatuated with, you know, uh, numbers. Oh, if I have a large number in my bank account, I'm good. You know, if I have a large number of followers, I'm good. It, it just has to be joy is not, you know, based off of a number, okay? Um, it should be about, you know, it, it should just be about experiencing good things with other brothers and sisters and doing, you know, good okay peace peace is contentment unity between people peace is a state of assurance a lack of fear and sense of contentment and that lack of fear is referring to perfect love casts about fear okay we still fear the most high it is fellowship harmony and unity between individuals peace is freedom from worry disturbance and oppressive thoughts. That truly is what peace is all about. And every single person should strive for that. They really should. Because why? Especially in these times, we know that Satan is going to cast things in our mind, but you want to be at peace knowing that you did everything possible to serve the most high. Okay? Long suffering. And we know this is patience, which is what? Slow to speak and slow to anger. Patience is slowness in avenging wrongs. It is the quality of restraint that prevents believers from speaking or acting hastily in the face of disagreement, opposition, or persecution. Patience is bearing pain and problems without complaining. This is going to be big as well uh, for 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 a lot of individuals, you know, especially those who have enjoyed the, the lavish uh, luxuries and benefits of living in Babylon, known as America. When you have to flee, most people don't have have no clue of what patience is. They're not going to be able to have long suffering because they've never been truly without things, as many other people in different countries. 
in America, let's face it, Babylon, there's a program to help you get on your feet in every aspect. As in other countries, maybe Mexico, uh, Honduras, you know, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, different countries, Thailand, all these places, Greece, you know, people are, are suffering um, and some people are not. But the thing is, you can, and notice how all these things intertwine. If you're at peace from worry, you will always have patience. But if you don't have no patience, you are never at peace. Okay? Gentleness, okay? merciful, sweet, and tender. This is a kindness that is an eagerness to put others at ease. It is sweet and attractive temperament that shows friendly regard. Just thinking of others before yourself. Okay, that's gentleness. Goodness is a generous and truly just open-hearted individual. Goodness is the selfless desire to be open-hearted and generous to others above what they deserve. So sometimes people don't deserve your greatness. Sometimes they don't deserve that love, but you show it to them anyway because Christ abides in you and you abide in Christ. The last portion, faith, also known as faithfulness. It's dependable, loyal, full of trust. Faithfulness is a firm devotion to the Most High. Loyalty to friends and dependability to carry out responsibilities. Faith is the conviction that even now the Most High is working acting on our behalf, even when we don't know it. Okay, and dependability. Understand that this doesn't just go with family, friends, and congregation. Dependability is owed to the most high only. Okay, you end up being dependable and loyal and full of trust to other brothers and sisters because you are in the most high and they are too, okay? Being equally yoked with believers will produce also good works of this loyal, trustworthy, and dependable behavior. Meekness, meekness is humble. Being a humble, calm, and non-threatening person. Not getting angry. But understand, meekness is a humble, non-threatening demeanor that derives from a position of strength and authority and is useful in calming another person's anger. Meekness is not a quality that is weak and passive, something that you should understand, okay? Very. Being humble takes a lot of strength, all right? And the last one is temperance. And temperance is followed in righteous behavior, right? Because, because I said, you know what? That well-being behavior, that well behavior, it's important. Temperance is to restrain our own emotions and actions and desires and to be in harmony, to be in peace with the will of the Most High. Temperance is going to the Most High's will and not living for ourselves also known as self-control.
All right, and the foundations. So on the left, you have Feast of Tabernacles under Moses, the sin and guilt offering. And then on the right, you have the Feast of Tabernacles under Christ. Okay. Once I said, this is all for personal study. So please be sure to study to show thyself approved. Make sure you're checking out these scriptures. Okay, very big. Okay, um, I'll read the middle. It says, sin offerings and guilt offerings focus on paying for sin. The sin offering atone for sins against the most high. The guilt offering address sins against others and included paying damages with interest. Various animals were offered depending on the person's position and income. Priests and leaders were, are as examples to others had to offer larger sacrifices for sins while the poor offered what they could afford. Blood was sprinkled on the altar. The parts of the animals were burned and often with wine and poured on them drink offering. Other parts were roasted for the priests since the priests were full-time tabernacle workers. Sacrifice animals were their main source of food. You see the scripture for the old covenant on the left, as I said, and the new covenant on the right. And for burnt offering, the sacrifice represented complete dedication and surrender to the Most High. The animal, usually an unblemished male, bears the worshiper's sins and dies in his or her place. After the blood was sprinkled on the altar, the animal was completely burned up. None of it was roasted for eating. And the last two, the grain or the meal offering, all right? This offering was given to the Most High in thankfulness. The people brought fine flour, unleavened cakes, or even roasted grain for the priest. The priest burned a symbolic handful at the altar and could partake of the rest. There was very little ceremony for this involved. And the last one, which is a peace offer, offering, also known as the fellowship offering. And this offering was symbolized as fellowship and peace with the Most High who shed blood. After some meat was ceremonially waved and given to the priests, worshipers and their guests would share in the feast as a meal with the Most High. Right, so by sharing all these, I really hope that everyone was edified in the Feast of Tabernacles lesson. First one was under Moses, second one was under Christ, and the third was the in gathering of the Holy Spirit's fruits for the upcoming harvest that we are in till this day. All right. I love you all very much. Thank you so much for joining me for this Feast of Tabernacles. And I hope to see you again next Shabbat. I love you. And until then, pray that we may be accounted worthy. And pray that we may be accounted worthy to endure until the end. Shabbat Shalom.